uh, one of our, well, the, the, the best condensed version of our vision and mission statement we could come up with was we, uh, we build disciples and we multiply churches. And, and as a pastor, uh, if we're a church planting church, I've got to be replicating myself and other guys or we're never going to plant another church. And so we have this teaching team that we, we've developed with several men in our church who have that gift, feel called to develop that gift, and, and you're hearing from them uh, over many weeks in this First Corinthians series. And so I just wanted to introduce you to Kevin Carrion, who's going to preach this passage this morning. And I wanted to stop and pray for him. So let's do that together. Father, we just ask your blessing on Kevin. You give him clarity of thought. Uh, you'd help him to, to just not be nervous. So you just bless him. Uh, speak through him. We expect that Holy Spirit. And uh, just disseminate your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Whew. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Here we go. I'm just taking it in right now, just now. All right, all right. It's different, because I'm usually up here with a guitar, and I'm singing. This is probably going to be the most you ever heard from me. Even in my life group, they know, like, I don't speak this much. And so this is going to be cool for them. Um, but anyways, so I lived with my mom, my stepdad, my half-sister, and my two stepbrothers in Arlington. Um, and way out in the boonies by Arlington Heights. Um, no, that's not right. Cisco Heights. Um, that's where Anna was living. Um, and we didn't have cable. We had that two rod things where you had to move them to get any kind of channels. And we only had a certain amount of channels. It was like four to like 13. And 13 was the most because it was Fox. And, you know, we had... Simpsons and morning cartoons and all that and so didn't watch a whole lot of TV we had a lot of outside stuff we did um, but on occasion I would go with my stepbrothers to their mom's house or to my real dad's house with my three half brothers and I would watch all the TV I could because they had cable um, and I used to watch a lot of MTV one for because I really love music and I like watching music. Um, and then second, there was a show called Jackass. These guys, they would do the craziest stuff, the craziest pranks, and it was crazy. Was, they could do it just because they could. They pretty much made the whole my beer culture grow viral. Before, it was just a saying that the South would use. Do you, do you know what a Renek's famous last word is? Hold my beer. Watch this. The act, uh, the Urban Dictionary defines hold my beer as this. The act of giving up one's alcoholic beverage temporarily to attempt the stunt he or she has never ventured. Some of these things they were doing were legal. Some of the things were not. Um, but as a teenager, I didn't care what they were doing. I thought it was hilarious. And as a teenager with friends that loved the show and wanted to do the same things, and we had a video camera, we did those things. Um, we might have tried to recreate them, but one thing I've learned from doing them is this. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you could take a full swing from your friend holding a bamboo stick across your back doesn't mean you should. Just because you can't take two scooters, ride them down a really steep road like a pair of skis down it doesn't mean you should. Just because you can snort wasabi up your nose doesn't mean you should. Or, just because you can play tetherball with a beehive, doesn't mean you should. There's some things I've learned from that show, and just from basic living, 
Um, just because you can eat two rows of Oreos doesn't mean you should. Or just because you can drink 32 ounces of Red Bull in 10 minutes doesn't mean you should. Just because you can put a Lord of the Rings reference in your sermon doesn't mean you should. And just because you can take a shot at your pastor doesn't mean you should. Oops. Too late. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And this is what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church when they are found pushing the boundaries of what grace lies. It is as if and when they came to a fragrant sexual sin, they were saying, hold my beer, watch this. Let's go into the text, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but all, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God will raise the Lord and also will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. For every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were brought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Let's go back to verse 12 and 13. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is for is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. What Paul is addressing here is that Corinthian believers wanted to continue in what their culture has always done. You see, in Corinth, their patron goddess was Aphrodite. If you didn't know your Greek mythology, Aphrodite was the goddess of beauty, love, and procreation. The temple of Aphrodite was in the center of Corinth. In and around the temple, there were prostitutes dedicated to serve the people, paying tribute and praying to Aphrodite. Corinth was the Amsterdam of the ancient world. Ship captains would dock in in Corinth and spend most of their earnings here at the temple, making the temple very wealthy. At one point, it was so wealthy that it had a thousand temple prostitutes dedicated to the goddess, some willing and some not so willing. With this, a big part of the Corinthian culture, the men were extremely chauvinistic. Their wives were regarded as their personal possession and only suitable for producing and raising the family where the men would just go to the prostitutes and young boys to, for their pleasurable sex. And this is what Paul was addressing. The, cis, the sexual person, no, the sexual culture that they were um, diving into and just doing willy-nilly was considered acceptable and didn't see anything wrong with it. The Corinthian believers were, were using what J Jesus had said in Mark 7 to apply what they were doing. So let's take a look at Mark 7, verses 14 to 19. And he called the people to him 
Again, this is Jesus. And he said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see whatever goes in a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters his does not since it enters not his heart but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. This was a response. It was Jesus' response to the Pharisees when they saw the disciples eating with their unwashed hands or with their defiled hands. Um, And they asked Jesus in verse 5 of Mark 7, Why do your disciples not walk accordingly to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And Jesus plainly says, after grilling the Pharisees about their traditions versus God's commandments, and that nothing outside a person that goes in will defile him or her. It goes in, it goes out. Maybe a few back nasty bacterias, you should still wash your hands. Just because you can eat with dirty hands doesn't mean you should. Um, Because of this reasoning, the Corinthians decided to stretch it out to fill their, fit their sexual desires or habits. Um, But they seem to miss the second part of what Jesus said in verse 20 to 23. And it says, And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From what, from, oh, from, for from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This is why Paul writes to them in verse 13, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. God will destroy both and the other, or one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, and for the Lord, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. It's pretty straightforward. God eventually will destroy both the food and the stomach, and we will no longer eat. We will no longer eat. What about eleven C's? Luncheon? Afternoon tea? Dinner? Supper? <laughs> Don't worry. We still get to eat and we will eat together, but we won't need to be satisfied or survive for it. Because food has no effect on our eternal destiny. But this is not true when it comes to sexual immorality. The body was simply not designed for that kind of living. We will talk more about that in a few. Just let's continue into verse 14. And God raised the Lord and also raised us up by his power. We just celebrated that, right? Two weeks ago, Easter Sunday, God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day. Acts 2.24 says, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was, po- it was not possible for him to be held by it. Death could not hold him. The same power... That same power lives in us as believers. So our body will be restored in the end. Further stating that the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? When we make a profession of faith, we put our faith in Christ. We become members of Christ and he is with him as the head of our body. We become united with Christ, ambassadors of Christ, a reflection of the one who saved us. And then Paul said in the rest of 15 and on, Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Any married couple would know what it's like when two people come together. There's 
you just know that person more intimately and more personally. It's just a mystery that God had designed it to be. In Genesis 2.24, for this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they become one flesh. So Paul pretty much is telling the Corinthians what they were doing in this act. Because they are first one spirit with the Lord, as it says in verse 17, but they're also having a sexual relationship with a prostitute. They are defiling who Christ was and what he did. They were trying to be one with Christ and one with the world. It doesn't work that way, guys. We cannot serve two masters. Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Paul isn't saying that sexual immorality is a greater sin than the others, but is unique on how it affects the body. In Charles Hodges' commentary on 1 Corinthians, he says, The idea runs through the Bible that there is something mysterious in sexual intercourse and in the effects that flow from it. For every other sin, however degrading and ruinous to the health, even drunkenness, is external to the body. That is, external to its life. But sexual immorality, involving as it does a community of life, is a sin against the body itself, because it is in... Oh, man. Incompatible with the the purpose of his creation and with its immoral destiny. The body is not made for sexual immorality. It is a con- contradiction to the truth of the body. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Flee from it. Do not stand there and watch. Flee. Escape. Run. Hide away. Just as Joseph did when he was alone with Potiphar's wife while she was trying to lie with him. He ran away. But sometimes as men, I know because I've tried doing it, pushing the boundaries of our strength against sexual temptations. And more often than not, we fail. We can't rely on our own strength. This is why we need to flee. We need to flee, as Gandalf would say, fly, you fools. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Your body, yours and mine, are temples of the Holy Spirit. Temples back then were two things. First, sacred, as a place where God lived and dwelled. So it couldn't be defiled without penalty. That's why the priests had to wear bells and a rope (laughs) tied to them in case they entered the Holy of Holies and they dropped dead because they entered God's holy and pure presence as unclean. And then the priests on the other side of the veil would hear the bells and they would have to pull him back in. Second, the temple was not owned by man, but by God. As believers, this is also true of us. We were bought with a price and owned by God. And by the same blood that bought us, it makes us holy, so the Holy Spirit dwells in us. You are not your own. Your body is not yours. It belongs to the master who bought you with blood. Mike talked about it in Romans 6 last week, and it bears to be repeated. What shall we say then? Are Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can, we, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Grace is not permission. Just because you 
can doesn't mean you should. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, by, with him by baptism into death. In that order, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too walk in newness of life. And it reminds me of a story of a boy in his ship. There was a boy who had a painstakingly built a model sailboat, and he had spent many days and weeks building it. When it was finally completed, he decided that he would test it out in the open water close to where he lived. The boy loved the boat. He was very proud of what he built. And so he went down to the water. First, he made sure the sails were just set just right. Then he, he excitedly placed it into the water with great anticipation. And he gave it a gentle push, and it took off. The wind caught the sails, and the boat cut through the water much better than he expected. What a sight, he said. The, bo- the boat skimmed along so smoothly, but then unexpectedly, before the boy realized what was happening, the, the sailboat just kept going. It didn't stop. He hoped that the wind would shift, but it didn't. The sailboat started to rapidly go off into the distance. The boy quickly waded into the water after it, hoping to catch up to it, but it had gone too far. The water was too deep. The boat faded into the distance and it disappeared. It was gone. When he got home crying, his mother asked, what's wrong? What's wrong? Did it not work? The boy replied, no, it worked too well. It sailed away. Sometime later, the boy was walking downtown and he passed a second-hand store and there in the window, he saw the sailboat that he had labored to build. He went to the store and went up to the sailboat. He picked it up and he said to the store owner, this boat is mine. He held it in his arms and began to walk out of the store. The owner, of course, said, wait a minute now. That's my boat. I paid someone for it. The boy said, no, 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 it, it's, it's my boat. I made it. Look, look at the scratches I did. Here, it has my initials on it, on the bottom. The owner said, I'm sorry, son. If you want it, you're going to have to pay for it. And the poor little guy he had didn't have any money with him, so he went home to see what odd jobs he could do in order to earn the money to purchase back the boat. The boy worked hard, and he saved his pennies, and one day he had enough money, and the boy went back to the store and bought his boat. And as he left, holding the sailboat close to his chest, the boy could be heard saying, You are my boat. You're twice my boat. First, you're my boat because I made you. Second, you're my boat because I bought you. You are twice owned. You were created by him, then found and bought with a price. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And then last week we also went to Romans 12. In the beginning of the chapter it says, I believe, or I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, which is what is good and acceptable and perfect. And I'm sure you're thinking now, Kev, I don't go to temples with prostitutes or sleep with my dad's wife. Kev, we don't live in that kind of culture anymore. Sure, there is some prostitution in the dark streets of Seattle, but I stay far from from that. I mean, we're up in Stanwood. But what does that have to do with me? Now, Josh, 
mentioned a few weeks back before Easter and all that. He said that the Greek word for sexual immorality was porneia. And that's where we get the word porn or pornography. Did you know that in 2006, the estimated revenue for sex-related entertainment and businesses were just under $13 billion in the U.S.? 28,258 users are watching porn every second. 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about porn with their friends. Just 55 adult, 55% of adults, 25 and older, believe that porn is wrong. One in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors use porn on a regular basis and are currently struggling. That's 50,000 U.S. church leaders. 64% of Christian men, 15% of Christian women say they watch porn at least once a month. You may say that we don't live in that culture anymore. I would say that you're right. It's much worse. I don't think people realize how deep and dark the porn industry is and how it affects it has on the people and in the world. I'm going to read an article from a website called Fight the New Drug. It's talking about the effects of porn on the brain. And it says, in case you're not a neurosurgeon, here's a crass course on how the brain works. Deep inside the brain, there's something called a reward center. Quotations. You got one, your dog's got one. For mammals, it comes standard. The reward center's job is to release pleasure chemicals into your brain whenever you do something healthy, like eating tasty food, doing a hard workout, or enjoying a kiss. The high that you get from that chemical rush makes you want to repeat that behavior again and again. Thanks to your reward center, your brain is hardwired to motivate you to do the things that will improve your health and the chances of survival. It's a great system, normally. The problem is the brain can be tricked. When the addictive substances are used, they give a brain, the brain a false signal. Since the brain can't tell the difference between the drug and the real healthy reward, it goes ahead and activates the reward center. An important chemical called dopamine is released which makes the brain start developing craving for the fake reward. As long as there's a, there's a lot of dopamine floating around in your brain, the cravings will keep getting stronger, and the consumer will feel super, motivation, feel super motivational to keep pursuing more of the drug. Essentially, addictive drugs hijack the brain, turning it around and forcing it in a direction it was never meant to go. Instead of encouraging consumers towards healthy behaviors, drugs lead the consumer into things that aren't healthy at all, and they can become dangerous. Guess what else does that? Porn. And you can see how this can affect a marriage as well. When a man who has been deeply addicted to porn, his dopamine levels are to the roof that... You know, it's so high that a normal person or a sexual intercourse with a real person is simply not enough. His standard in his mind is for sex is unrealistic. And in turn, he goes back to porn, making his wife feel unloved, confused, unworthy, and not knowing that, knowing that she can't please her husband is so damaging. Sexual immorality is everywhere, in the open, and, but also hidden and way more accessible. It is saturated in the culture. It is accepted and even celebrated. To the world, porn and prostitution are not the same thing. 
to the believer it should be. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you have heard it that it was said, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust with her has already committed adultery in her, with her in his heart. It's, not what's in, it's what's inside of your heart that follows you. Whether you're looking at a screen, across the office hallway, across the street, if you have lusted over that person in your heart, you have committed adultery with her, with them in your heart. It starts here. And that's why the psalmist asked God to create a new heart in him. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Doing the research for this and looking at the stats, I was shocked and then I was angry. Then I was sad. I knew the statistics were high, just not that high. And I was angry because I was a part of that statistic. I was exposed to porn at age seven. When my friend brought it, an adult magazine that he took from his dad's stash. This was the start of my addiction. That grew worse as I grew older as a teenager to a young adult and to a husband. Hidden and fought alone until it was brought into light. Even though I repented and had victories in my in fleeing over my life, it did come with consequences. Looking back now, I can see the effect it had on me, my relationship with Anna. Before and after my sins were revealed, and now I see the evil behind the scenes of the porn industry. In this passage brought me to find the things that, that I can do and that I should do because of Christ. I got three things, freedom, flee, and fight. You can find freedom from sin and you should find it in Christ. If right now you're struggling with sin, it doesn't have to be sexual sin, it could be any sin, but if you have been fighting alone, not wanting to let go of it because it's your problem, it's your deal, but you're still tired of failing and tired of the guilt and shame, it's time to let go of your pride. Bring your struggles and your sins to the foot of the cross. Only in Christ will you find freedom. Put your sin to death. Become new in Christ. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You were buried, therefore, with him by baptism, baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Second, I can and should flee sexual immorality. Verse 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. Our bodies are not made for sexual immorality. It was made for the Lord. We are twice owned and bought with a price. So to those who are struggling with your sexual sin, you know your own tendencies, your routines, your temptations that lead you to it. If you don't ask, ask for wisdom and discernment to what they are, then you need to change your routines and habits as we pursue righteousness to glorify God in our bodies. 
when t- temptation comes, we need to turn. We need to, when it's turn to him. And when it's hard to run, pray for the Lord for a way out. He will give it to you. He is a good father. Sometimes we need to physically turn our eyes away. We need to step out of the room. Or maybe we need to just end that unhealthy relationship. We need to flee, run, and escape. So we can fight another day on other battlefields. I can, thirdly, I can and should fight the darkness with the light. We should fight. We are called to make war on sin and on the enemy. Be proactive, not just reactive. Fighting with prayer. Put on the armor of God daily. Be in his word. Fighting, we should fight by bringing awareness and acknowledging the darkness. And just like the prostitutes in the temple, some of these girls on the screens are not there by choice. And they don't have a voice. (laughs) Some of these girls are victim of sex trafficking. Promised a job of a better life, but put into the sex trade. Support and pray for those organizations that are fighting to spread the word to to free these girls. We need to fight. We need to speak for those who can't truly speak for themselves. Fight for the unborn. Some of you are fighting when you're worshiping every second Saturday at the church at Planned Parenthood, worshiping God. You're preparing the battlefield. Fight for your marriage. Purity in your marriage. Pray for your husband. Pray for your wife. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. Your marriage is preaching the gospel to your kids and to the people around you. Fight for biblical marriages. The darkness of this world is growing darker and larger. And what are we doing to stop it? What are you doing to shine the light in the darkness? For those who may not be struggling with a deep-rooted sin and, and have found freedom in Christ, what are you doing with that freedom? Are you growing in your faith, doing what God has commanded us to do? to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Are you sharing the hope that's within you, furthering the kingdom of God to shine brightly in the darkness? Let's pray. Lord, I pray what the psalmist said in Psalms 51. Create in me a new, create in me a clean heart, O God, and a renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners return to you. Lord, I pray that we walk in newness of life that is found in you and in the joy of your salvation, that we would glorify you with our bodies, that we would not be conformed by the world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Remind us that we are no longer slaves to sin, but to righteousness. We pray for those without a voice or the freedom to, Thank you that you are faithful to us and your promises to us. That you never leave us or forsake us. That nothing will snatch us out of your hands and that we are more than conquerors in your name. Be with us as we make war 
and bring light into this dark world for the glorification of your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin, for uh, bringing the word and for bagging on the pastor for making Lord of the Rings references and then making them yourself. The scripture says that when a disciple is fully taught, he will be like his teacher. So it's <laughs> my fault. <laughs> Just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should. And that's what Paul's saying to the Corinthian church. That's what the word of God is saying to us. Uh, Paul's rebuke is a needed warning to the church both then and now. So shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? Certainly not. Rather, let us represent Christ rightly and walk in freedom from sin. And we will tell the world around us about the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Emmaus Road Church, you are sent.